Seconds after takeoff from St. Louis, Missouri, the engine of an American Airlines MD-82 erupts into flames. Alarm bells ring loudly in the cockpit as the pilots grapple with the emergency. But they soon discover that this is no normal emergency. Within moments, the captain's instruments fail and the aircraft begins to lose vital systems. Will the crew be able to make it back to the airport? Or will the fire spell disaster for everyone on board? This is the story of American Airlines Flight 1400. On the afternoon of September 28, 2007, 138 passengers and five crew boarded an American Airlines MD-82 at St. Louis Lambert International Airport in Missouri. They were bound for Chicago, a short one-hour journey north. It was a warm and sunny day at St. Louis, with light winds, scattered clouds, and temperatures of about 30 degrees Celsius. All in all, a good day to go flying. But this picture of perfection was deceptive. In fact, as the passengers filed in and took their seats, they had no idea quite how much danger they were in. In a few minutes, a relatively benign technical problem would collide with some very human faults with disastrous consequences. The captain of this flight was 59 years old and had been flying for American for the past 17 years. For the past four years, he had been a first officer on the Boeing 777. And now, just six months from retirement, he had returned as a captain on the MD-80. He was highly experienced, with more than 14,000 total flying hours to his name, 6,000 of which as captain. He had started his career with the US Air Force in 1970, and since joining American Airlines, he had a spotless training and performance record. Sitting to his right was a 43-year-old first officer. He had joined American in 1999, and between that and his time with the US Air Force and US National Guard, he had built up about 7,000 flight hours, 3,000 of which were on the MD-80. Like the captain, he had an unblemished safety and performance record in his time with American Airlines. But as we're about to see, not all problems show up in training or in performance reviews. For Flight 1400, the problem started almost immediately, when the pilots tried to start the left-hand engine. For some reason, it just wasn't starting. They wouldn't make it to Chicago on one engine, so the pilots called the ground crew to get the engine started up manually. A manual engine start doesn't involve spinning the fan blades by hand, but rather it involves a ground crew member inserting a specialised wrench into the side of the engine and twisting it to open the engine's start valve. With the valve open, high pressure is introduced into the engine, spinning the compressor blades in the engine's core and starting the engine. But when the ground crew member reached the aircraft, this is not what he did. In fact, it was pretty much standard procedure for ground crew at American Airlines not to carry out the procedure the prescribed way, because it required them to spend a long time trying to locate the particular tool they needed. So, instead of doing it this way, which was outlined in the manuals, the ground crew member pushed a screwdriver into a different button on the underside of the engine to achieve the same result. He knew that he was supposed to only use his hand to press this button, but that was hard to do given the position of the button inside the engine. After a bit of back and forth between him and the captain, the left engine eventually started. But unbeknownst to anyone on board, this quick fix employed by the ground crew member had created a deadly problem. Deep inside the left engine was now a ticking time bomb. With the last of the baggage loaded, it was time to get underway. It was Friday, and many of the passengers were looking forward to a weekend trip to Chicago. The only shame was that none of them had used my discount code to pick up a weekender bag. This durable carry-all is the perfect way to protect your belongings when you travel. A lot like the MD-80, it's rugged and built to last, and unlike the MD-80, it has thick leather handles and a quality feel to it. This episode is sponsored by Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post is a monthly membership club delivering a box of awesome with top shelf goods from under the radar brands. It's free to join and you can skip a month or cancel any time. 90% of the products come from small brands, many of which are based in the US. Every box of awesome has around $70 worth of goods inside, but costs you only a fraction of the value. Every month, they introduce their members to cool new products, like outdoor gear, barware, home and kitchen goods, clothing, and more, even things like live oysters. And they decide what to send you based on a preference quiz you fill out. 
You'll get a box of awesome assigned to you, and before it's shipped, you'll get a preview of what comes inside to decide if you'd like to keep it, swap it for a different box, or skip the month entirely for no charge. You only pay for what you want. I really like the Weekender bag, but there's so much more to choose from, including these wireless noise cancelling earbuds. They're great when you're trying to get some work or study done in peace, and they last 9 hours on a single charge. To get 20% off your first box of awesome, click the link in the description and enter GD Aviation 20 at checkout, or go to bespokepost.com forward slash GD Aviation 20. At 5 minutes past 1 that afternoon, the plane pushed back from the gate, fully loaded with fuel, baggage and 143 passengers and crew. The pilots began taxiing out to runway 30 left at St. Louis, happy to have the maintenance snafu behind them. But the ground crew were not the only ones being sloppy on this day. As the pilots taxied out to the runway, a casual attitude pervaded the cockpit. The captain commented that he felt ambivalent now that he had only six months left until retirement. As the first officer read out the before takeoff checklist, he stopped at various points to chat casually with the captain, settling into the mood which he had set in the cockpit. The captain, rather than instructing the first officer to stay on task, engaged him in conversation between checklist items. This kind of chatter is strictly against FAA and company policy, which state that until the plane has reached an altitude of 10,000 feet, pilots can only discuss things which directly pertain to the flight. This is known in aviation as the sterile cockpit rule. If this had been like any other flight, this break from standard operating procedure might have gone without consequence. But on this day, this laid back approach would lead to the pilots being caught completely off guard just seconds after takeoff. The captain briefed the first officer on what they would do if they had a problem on takeoff, saying, quote, Unless we're on fire, we'll go to Chicago. If we're on fire, we'll come back and land here. Little did he know how prescient this statement would be. Just after 10 past 1, the captain lined the aircraft up on the runway and pushed the engines to take off thrust. At that very moment, the start valve on the left-hand engine opened. The electrical switch which controlled its position had been damaged by the ground crew member's screwdriver back at the gate. And now, as the plane accelerated on the runway, high-pressure air began spinning one of the engine's starter turbines. As the plane continued down the runway, this turbine began to freewheel, picking up tremendous speed. The only indication in the cockpit that this was happening was a small annunciator light. But this light wasn't positioned where the pilots could easily see it. So, when the plane reached takeoff speed, the captain lifted the nose and brought the plane into the sky. Both he and the first officer were completely unaware that the left engine was hiding a fatal flaw. They raised the gear and began climbing out over St. Louis. Just seconds after lifting off, as the plane passed through 1500 feet, the first officer noticed that a light had illuminated, which said that the start valve for the left engine was open. He told the captain about it, who acknowledged the issue. As the pilots continued climbing, figuring that they would fix whatever problem this was in a few minutes, the rapidly spinning turbine in the left engine failed catastrophically. A fire then erupted in the engine. The engine fire warning sounded in the cockpit. The first officer immediately declared an emergency, telling air traffic control that they had a fire in the left engine and that they needed to return to the airport straight away. The controller told the pilots to turn right and said that he would bring them back around to the airport. Meanwhile, the pilots got to work. The captain announced that he would fly the plane, while the first officer worked through the checklist. This splitting of duties is exactly how the pilots had been trained to handle emergencies. Time is critical when it comes to fire on an aircraft. The pilots needed to complete some key items in their checklists to maximise their chances of a safe return to St. Louis. The first officer took out his checklists and opened the page for engine fire, damage or separation. The purpose of this checklist, in the event of an engine fire, is pretty straightforward. It instructs the pilots on how to shut down the affected engine, cut off the fuel supply to it, and then put out the fire. There are several further steps in this checklist, but these are by far the most important. But now, at the very beginning of this very serious emergency, the pilots began to flounder. Despite their spotless records and despite the frequency with which engine fires are practiced in the simulator, the pilots will now make a series of grave errors which will endanger the lives of everybody on board.
The first officer quickly carried out the first two items on the checklist. He disconnected the auto throttle and set the left engine thrust lever to idle. But before he could complete the vital third step of cutting off fuel to the engine and pulling the fire handle to extinguish the fire, the captain interrupted him by handing over the controls. In this vital moment, when the first officer should have been shutting down the blazing engine, the captain handed him the controls. His reason for this? He wanted to tell the flight attendants to prepare the cabin for an emergency landing. Something which wasn't necessary at this stage, given that the passengers were already seated and strapped in. So now, with the first officer flying the aircraft and the checklist sitting idle, the fire continued burning. As it burned, it began to eat away at electrical wiring and even began to damage the plane's hydraulic systems. In a few short seconds, this emergency was about to get a lot worse. The captain told the flight attendants that they had a fire in the left engine and that they would be landing back at St. Louis in the next five minutes. He told them that they would probably not need to evacuate, but that they should prepare the cabin just in case. At this critical stage of the emergency, this briefing was completely unnecessary. The pilot's sole focus should have been on flying the plane, completing the engine fire checklist and navigating back to the airport. But the lack of adherence to standard operating procedures the pilots had exhibited on the ground was now coming back to bite them in the air. The controller instructed Flight 1400 to turn right again, this time to head back parallel to runway 30 right where they were being set up to land. With the first officer now flying the plane, it was the captain's job to handle the radios and carry out the checklists. This was a confused and chaotic response to an emergency which they had trained for dozens of times. Finally, after more than a minute, the captain resumed flying the plane. But in some important ways, it was already too late. The captain's primary flight display here, and his navigation display here, had failed. The fire in the engine had destroyed the electrical wiring feeding these instruments. These are two of the most vital instruments in the cockpit, which tell the captain his speed, altitude and heading. Now, he would have to rely on small old-fashioned standby instruments to see this important information. It was an ominous sign. What else could be damaged behind the scenes? Over a minute and a half since he first started it, the first officer resumed the engine fire checklist, finally getting to that third step which involved cutting the fuel supply to the engine. But there was a problem. The first officer couldn't move the switch. For some reason, it wouldn't budge. What's worse is that without this, he wouldn't be able to complete the next step, which involved pulling the fire handle to discharge the engine's two fire extinguishers. Amid the first officer's desperate attempts to put out the inferno, the haunting fire alarm continued to sound in the cockpit. The right engine was now working at high power just to compensate for the loss in thrust from the left engine. The captain was working hard to control his stricken aircraft. With the left engine now producing no power, he had to counteract the swinging motion of the plane to the left hand side by stepping on the right rudder. The pilots were overloaded. They needed to make it back to the airport as soon as possible. They had no idea that their problems were only just beginning. As the aircraft's electrical systems faltered, the pilots began to lose more instruments. The captain pointed out that the reverse or unlocked indicator light for the left engine was now on. This is what the thrust levers look like on an MD-80. If one of those deployed in flight, it could spell disaster. The light telling the pilots that the reverser was unlocked was on. But was this real, or was it just more faulty information generated by the aircraft's failing electrical system? The pilots were rattled. The haunting alarms continued to blare, warning them that the fire in the left engine was still raging. The captain told the first officer to pull the fire handle. This should have been done minutes ago, but the first officer had been unable to shut off fuel to the engine. The first officer pulled the fire handle, but to his horror, the extinguishers wouldn't discharge. What was happening their plane? This was a question the pilots would not have time to answer. They needed to make it back to the runway fast. At this point, Air Traffic Control instructed the pilots to fly heading 250 degrees so that he could set them up for a landing on runway 30 right at St. Louis. The pilots were stretched to the limit. Behind them, 
138 lives hung in the balance. Then, the cockpit door swung open. The electrical locking mechanism, which kept it closed, had now failed as well. The first officer reached back and tried to shut it, but it just slammed against the doorframe and bounced back again. He tried again and again, but the door wouldn't close. Their MD-80 was falling apart. Flight 1400 was now just minutes from the airport. The pilots had hauled their crippled aircraft around the airport, and now they would try to limp it onto the runway. The first officer continued trying to close the cockpit door, but to no avail. Meanwhile, the captain had managed to discharge both of the fire bottles into the engine. Finally, it appeared that the fire was under control. But this wasn't the good news that it should have been. The left engine had been blazing for so long that it had already caused significant damage, which the pilots were now about to come face to face with. The runway was now in view, about six miles out. As the captain flew towards it, he and the first officer discussed what their flap setting and approach speed should be for landing. The first officer lowered the landing gear lever and carried out some final checks, putting the hydraulic pumps on high and setting the so-called bugs on the airspeed indicators so that the captain would know what speed to fly at for the approach. Next, the first officer lowered the flaps to 23 degrees to allow the plane to slow down for landing. The captain tried to start the auxiliary power unit, or APU. This would provide the plane with an additional source of electrical and hydraulic power, given that the plane's full power supply was now being drawn from just the right-hand engine. But it wasn't working. For some reason, the pilots couldn't get the APU to start. This was no ordinary engine fire. There was something seriously wrong with their plane. The sheer variety and complexity of these failures was not something the pilots had trained for in all of their years of flying. This was a new kind of emergency. And unbeknownst to the pilots, it was an emergency that they had caused by their confused reaction to the initial fire warning. But travelling at over 250 km per hour and just moments from landing, there was no time to reflect on this yet. With their plane falling apart, system by system, their only task was to get back to the runway as soon as possible. At St. Louis, air traffic control had scrambled the emergency services. Fire brigades and ambulances were now waiting beside the runway, expecting the worst. But now, just two or three miles from the runway, Flight 1400 encountered one of its most serious problems yet. The first officer noticed that the landing gear indicator lights had not illuminated. This was a nightmare scenario. It appeared that whatever electrical and hydraulic problems had been plaguing the aircraft had spread to the landing gear system too. Without landing gear, the plane, with three hours worth of fuel in its tanks, would have to touch down on the hard concrete runway, sending sparks flying and possibly igniting a fireball. But there was a backup system for the landing gear. Under the first officer's seat was a handle which, when pulled, would extend the landing gear manually. There was just one problem. Now less than a minute from touchdown, there was no way the pilots could get the gear to extend in time. But given all of the electrical problems the plane was experiencing, there was another possibility. It could be that the gear was down, but that the indicator lights had failed. The captain quickly radioed the tower, asking if they could see whether the landing gear were extended. The controller said that he could see the main gear, but that the nose wheel appeared not to have extended. This was not the news the pilots had been hoping for. They didn't want to keep their damaged jet in the air for any longer than was absolutely necessary. But landing without a nose wheel was not a safe option. They had no choice but to go around. The captain slammed the one remaining engine to maximum power and pulled the plane's nose up. But it was a precarious maneuver. The plane was heavy, it was low and slow, and with its main gear and flaps extended, there was a huge amount of drag. The captain somehow had to pull the lagging plane into the sky with just one engine. With all of this going against him, he was finding it nearly impossible to gain the life-saving speed he needed to keep the plane in the air. For the first time on this day, the safety of the aircraft's flight path itself was now in peril. On top of this, the aircraft's condition continued to worsen. The crew's situation was fast deteriorating into a potentially deadly one. The captain was at his absolute limits. There was now so much for him and the first officer to do 
that they had started to leave out multiple parts of multiple checklists. They had to focus on only the most important items. It was beginning to be too much for the overstretched crew of two to deal with. The captain called a flight attendant and told her to get the off-duty captain who was sitting in the passenger cabin to come up to the cockpit immediately. In less than 30 seconds, the off-duty pilot was up in the cockpit. His presence would lighten the pilot's workload somewhat, but there was only so much he could do given the state of the plane. He began trying to close the cockpit door while the captain spoke with air traffic control. The captain told the controller that he wanted to stay close to the airport and that he may have to come back and land on runway 24. Runway 24 was much shorter than runway 30 left and right, and it didn't line up with the wind. But the captain was so concerned about the plane's inability to climb that he was beginning to think he wouldn't make it back to runway 30. In an effort to help the captain gain some much needed speed, the first officer raised the flaps a few notches. The captain then slowly turned the plane to the right. The controller had cleared him to climb to 3,000 feet, but there was no way he would be able to make it that high at this rate. Despite the need to keep engine power high on the remaining engine, the captain didn't want to overstress it. The last thing he needed now was for his one good engine to exhaust itself and fail as well. The captain told his colleagues that he needed to go back and land immediately because he couldn't maintain airspeed. He was the one flying the aircraft and he had a real sense of the sheer difficulty it had with staying airborne. Again trying to help with this critical speed situation, the first officer offered to retract the flaps all the way up. This would make the wings smaller and smoother, creating less drag. But the captain was concerned that doing so would cause him to lose the life-giving lift that the flaps were there for. He decided to compromise and told the first officer to retract the flaps at the back of the wing as these create most of the drag and to keep the slats at the front of the wing extended. Again, the captain said that they needed to land now. He knew that if they kept on flying, they would either burn up the remaining engine or get so slow that the plane would start descending. In the back of the aircraft, it wasn't just the passengers who were nervous, it was the flight attendants too. They could tell that the aircraft was struggling and it didn't exactly inspire confidence that the pilots had aborted their landing and called for an off-duty pilot to come up to the cockpit immediately. They knew that whatever this was, it was serious. The first officer asked the captain what runway they should go back and land on. The captain said that he wanted the longest one. The off-duty pilot pointed out that that was runway 30 left, which was a full 2,000 feet longer than the next longest runway. With the controllability problems and hydraulic issues the aircraft was having, that 2,000 feet could make all the difference. Then, the relief pilot noticed something alarming. The plane had lost all hydraulic pressure on the right-hand side. This explained why the nose wheel hadn't dropped, and, combined with the loss of the left hydraulic system, it explained some of the difficulty the captain was having with controlling the aircraft. At this point, the plane was now flying parallel to runway 30 left, with the controller directing the pilots back for a landing. The captain was still struggling to maintain altitude, but his speed was now gradually increasing thanks to the raising of the flaps. The sense of urgency mounted as the plane's condition continued to worsen. Now, the first officer decided to try to lower the landing gear. It was better that he did this now than just before landing. He pulled the gear extension handle under his seat and the pilots waited. To their great relief, they could hear the noise as the landing gear bay doors opened into the slipstream and the wheels slowly dropped. Just to confirm, the first officer radioed the tower, asking whether they could see the nose wheel. This time, they could. The gear indicator lights were still blank, but now the crew had the confirmation they so desperately needed. Their landing gear were down. Now just minutes from landing, it was time for the crew to tell their passengers what to expect. Up until this point, they had been more or less in the dark about what had been happening. This time, the captain delegated the task to the off-duty pilot, who got on the intercom and told the passengers that they would shortly be making an emergency landing and that they should fasten their seatbelts and follow the instructions of the flight attendants. Many of the passengers were terrified. They had no idea what to expect. 
Finally, after a strained journey around the airport, Flight 1400 was lined up with runway 30 left. The controller had cleared it to land, and now there was nothing left to do but for the captain to get his plane and his 142 passengers and crew safely onto the runway. No longer working against the aircraft to get it to climb, the captain was now letting the plane settle into where it wanted to go, back down towards the ground. The first officer lowered the flaps to 28 degrees, helping the plane to slow for landing. And then, finally, some good news. The landing gear indicator lights had just started to work. All three of them were green, telling the pilots that the gear were not just down, but locked into position. This was a relief, but the pressure the captain was under was immense. He had to avoid another go-around at all costs. The aircraft was just 500 feet above the ground now, and the runway was dead ahead. The first officer told the captain that he was fast, so that the best way to land would be to pull the throttle to idle just before landing, and let the plane float down onto the runway. The automated voice began counting down the plane's height above the runway. 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. Finally, the plane touched down. The captain slammed on the brakes, and within a few moments, the speeding plane skidded to a stop on the runway. The passengers erupted into applause. After a horrendous ordeal, everyone on board was finally safe. But despite the positive outcome, big questions remained. What caused the engine fire in the first place? And why did it cause so much damage? Investigators from the US National Transportation Safety Board got to work immediately to find the answers to these questions. And what they found revealed some critical failings at American Airlines. As it turned out, the reason the engine wouldn't start on the ground at the beginning of the flight was that a filter inside the engine had disintegrated and blocked airflow to a key part of the engine. This should have been picked up by American Airlines maintenance procedures, but these procedures were found to be lacking by investigators. To make matters worse, the ground crew misidentified the air turbine starter valve, or ATSV, as being the reason the engine wouldn't start, rather than a problem with this filter. On top of this, they used an unapproved method to start the engine, which led to the fire it experienced directly after takeoff. So, we have maintenance and oversight problems at American Airlines, as well as ground crew who were carrying out unapproved procedures. But from a human factors perspective, the biggest lessons which can be learned here are to do with how the pilots responded to the engine fire when it happened. The final report into this incident recommended that airlines review their pilot training on task allocation and workload management during emergencies to ensure that when pilots are running emergency checklists, they should not engage in non-essential tasks, in this case, like calling the flight attendants and talking to air traffic control. If the first officer had continued with his engine fire checklist uninterrupted, it's very likely that the plane would have returned to St. Louis on the first attempt with minimal issues. One pilot, cited in the report, asked rhetorically, what is the easiest way to prepare yourself to deal with events that are unfamiliar to you, events where there are no established procedures? Based on my flying experience and aviation safety background, I firmly believe that the answer is rigorous adherence to standard operating procedures and cockpit discipline on each and every flight. When you do this, you are preparing yourself for the unexpected. The pilots of Flight 1400 were not prepared for the unexpected, and they did their jobs in a system which, through poor oversight of its maintenance procedures, threw the unexpected at them. In this case, the passengers of Flight 1400 were lucky that they remained live test subjects in this very risky experiment. If you enjoyed this video, then you can get early access to ad-free videos here, and if you'd like to watch more, there's a playlist just here. Thanks for watching, and see you for the next video.